Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, is one of those almost hallowed American presidents, having led the country, as many suppose, out of the Great Depression and into victory in World War II. His fireside chats reassured millions, and his proclamation of the four freedoms still echoes today. But is there a darker side to FDR's legacy? Did the champion of the four freedoms violate those freedoms in stunning disregard for the Bill of Rights? Today's guest answers yes to those questions, and we'll find out why in this edition of Independent Conversations. Welcome, everybody. I'm Graham Walker, coming to you today from the Independent Institute in Oakland, California, right across the bay from San Francisco. And we're gathering together today to introduce everybody to our author, David Beto, uh, who has recently published this fabulous book with the Independent Institute called The New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights, which we're going to be discussing today. Welcome, David Beto. Thank you for inviting me. So glad you're here. David Beto is senior fellow here with the Independent Institute, also professor emeritus at the University of Alabama. Uh, previously wrote a book with us called TRM Howard, Doctor, Entrepreneur, and Civil Rights Pioneer. Uh, another interesting book, Taxpayers in Revolt, uh, he was a key advisor on the book New Deal Rebels, which we'll hear more about perhaps. Uh, he's written for the Independent Review, the Journal of Southern History, the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Atlanta Journal, Constitution, et cetera. Uh, so we're proud to have you affiliated with the Independent Institute, David Beto. And because this is such an important book, we've also asked another notable New Deal era historian, Amity Schles, to join us. Hi, Amity. I'm glad you're here. Hello there. It's a pleasure to have you. So many people know you, uh, of course, as a, what, a four-time New York Times bestseller author, especially you're well known for your book, The Forgotten Man, A New History of the Great Depression. Um, I think I saw that the National Review called that book, The Forgotten Man, the finest history of the Great Depression ever written. Um, and you've had a big influence on everyone's uh, re-understanding of many misunderstandings around uh, the Great Depression and the New Deal. Uh, you also wrote a great book called the, called Great Society and New History. You're the chairman of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. You also write for the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Bloomberg, Forbes, etc. Uh, we're so delighted to have you with us, Amity. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad to be here, especially with David, such a splendid author. Yeah, David, this is a pretty remarkable book, uh, <laughs> The New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights, The Untold History of untold story of FDR's concentration camp censorship and mass surveillance. Uh, David, you wrote this book and, and you've titled it in a way that clearly um, is pretty provocative. Uh, sounds to me just from the title that you're trying to counteract uh, a misperception or perhaps you're trying to undo the hagiography around FDR. Is that fair? That's fair. It's kind of an in-your-face title, but I think it can be backed up with evidence. <laughs> uh well, but the, uh, the book yeah. is full of evidence. Yes. Yeah, it has so, a, I, uh, I try to spend a lot of time on this book. I spent more on this book than I have any other book I've ever written, and, and, and I was going to give up on it. My wife encouraged me to continue, but it involves a lot of archival research, the secondary literature uh, as much as I could do, and um, a lot of different topics where I had to do primary research. But it ended up, I think, being worth it in the end. But it was a big research job. A, a big job. My goodness. You know, uh, there are things that, of course, I never knew about. I mean, you know, having obviously missed the live history here myself, uh, I know that uh, there are details that you unearthed. For example, you mentioned uh, you gave this wonderful narrative about Hugo Black's committee. You called it an inquisition committee. Uh, and you said that uh, on page 11 of your book, that the committee monitored private communications on a scale previously unrivaled in U.S. history. What Can you just briefly give us the thumbnail? What did Hugo Black's committee do that was tantamount to this kind of uh, mass uh, monitoring of private communication? Well, the term Inquisition what Committee was, was from the time. And this was a term that was would be used by mainstream newspapers. So what's interesting about this community Committee, unlike what we see now, is it had bipartisan criticism from people that I remember in my youth, like, uh, you know, were sort of standard Democratic politicians like Emanuel Seller, who was around at the time, were very critical of this committee. Now, the surveillance was because Black was trying to 
investigate anti-New Deal organizations and individuals, and he would bring them in, and, you know, sometimes he'd score points, sometimes they'd score points. So he thought, how can I blindside these people? And he came up with an idea of going to the FCC and, well, going to the administration, basically, because there was a rule at the time that telegraph companies had to save copies of all telegrams. And so he ah. went to the FCC and he said, look, I want all telegrams. This is one thing he did. Sent to and from all members of Congress from like a nine month period. And then he started a target to, to more individual people. And so he went to Western Union and said, uh, I've got this. Uh, uh, you know, I want to look at these telegrams. They refuse to cooperate because, you know, it's bad for business. But the federal government, the FCC, ordered them to cooperate. So Black and his staffers and FCC staffers went in to Western Union and the other telegraph companies. But Western Union was the big one. And they proceeded to search by hand th something like three million telegrams. And... There Good was instructions gracious. for them to avoid private information, but of course, they said, do anything related, look at anything related to not lobbying and copying it or take notes. Of course, lobbying would be what we're doing, right? By their definition, would be any attempt uh -huh. to have mm -hmm. an impact on public opinion. So uh, this is mass surveillance. Now, telegrams are kind of forgotten now. They're sort of quaint. I think the Western Union stopped even requiring them. But at the time, that was 50% of long-distance communication was through telegrams. They were the email the of the time. Way. They were instantaneous or almost instantaneous. People would uh -huh. say things in them like they would say things in emails. They wouldn't say in letters. They didn't save them generally. So he'd pull these uh -huh. things out, and he, these committee members had no idea that, I mean, these witnesses had no idea that their telegrams had been, had been taken in this way so it wasn't even really a standard subpoena it was something in a whole different category it was wholly extra legal it sounds like yeah and there's some indication someone just pointed out to me that uh, uh james mcgregor burns there's an interesting passage in there about how fdr had a private telegram and nobody knows how he got it and i'm starting to wonder whether to what extent this stuff actually leaked to fdr of course proving that is difficult but he had all these telegrams, right? He had access to them, and there was really no check on it. So the committee, Black's committee, was a U.S. Senate committee. Um, how was this? You're attributing this to the New Deal more generally. Was the Black committee somehow linked into the New Deal? How is the New Deal at fault, uh, David, for this mass surveillance? Oh, uh, the, the whole idea of the committee came from the administration, from FDR and his advisors. And they said, we got to get a good guy to lead this. And they first went to Burton Wheeler, who would probably would have been a mistake because Wheeler ended up eventually sort of turning on FDR. But then he said, well, go to Black, you know, and he went to Black and Black was a, a, in a, minute, a down the line administration loyalist, but extremely effective. I think it was Black's son mm -hmm. said that, um, uh, no, FDR's son said, if you want anything done, you go to Black. He was a key point man. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to some of his speeches, there's only one of them really that I know of on audio. I mean, the guy's like, this is a this is a, a populist, you know, passionate populist for the New Deal. A, pa a passionate populist for, you know, class warfare. He is mm -hmm. very loyal to the administration, very much uh, an effective legislative leader. So, uh, so it's, a, it's an alliance to... between two people that are committed to the same goal, namely FDR Got and Black. Got it. Okay. Feel free to jump in here at any point, Amity, as well, we talk about Well, I just wanted these. to ask, um, one of the issues before the Black Committee was legislation relating to utilities, right, David? That was the original purpose of the committee, to right. look at the influence of utilities on this, the, the death sentence, the, the bill 
highly right. regulatory so was... bill that the, the administration was pushing. There were all these telegrams. Some of them were indeed suspect, but I think they exaggerated right. that. That so were sent. He... But then they expanded it to include all sorts of other things beyond that. It, right. You make the point very well in your book that this was licensed for fishing expeditions. But just to get back to the one of the, the original um, impetuses, Roosevelt created the Tennessee Valley Authority to light up the South. But there were private companies that said they could light up the South, including Commonwealth and Southern. After TVA was created, the government, the New Deal, made other efforts to kind of undermine or squeeze out private utilities. And one was this law the, known as the Death Sentence Act because it so constrained private utilities and in particular their ability to raise capital. Utilities uh, are a front-end c- capital-intensive industry. You need a lot of money to start laying the wires in those days. Um that law came along and the utilities said, we're going to be beat by TVA unless we fight. And Black himself was, TVA was a Southern institution. Roosevelt had this weird idea of arranging the American economy by river basins. And he started with the Tennessee Mm -hmm. Valley, but Alabama was in there. Black was from Alabama. So there was an enormous, um, benefit from government coming through the TVA, spending for a power system, job creation. There were places in the South where the TVA was the only company hiring this government authority. Um, And that's part of the scene for a senator from the South, like Black, too. But it's also why the utilities companies were so desperate and even sent some perhaps untoward programs. They really wanted to stop the Death Sentence Act, which for them was the final blow. They did not manage to do that, though, right, David? No, eventually they they were able to, they were defeated. Um, Right. But it was was a big effort. And, you know, and you may be able to answer this better than me, but I think that Roosevelt had on his mind eventually to create a lot of other TVA. That this was, That's right. Yeah, this well, was a more general a, agenda. Dams, I think Cooley Dam is an example. So you have, before Roosevelt, we have the Hoover Dam, which is a pact among states. That is, it's an interstate project written for constitutionality, with constitutionality in mind. Think of Herbert Hoover, the president preceding, and this is the point you make as well, David, uh, FDR, he, he liked to respect the Constitution and do things constitutionally. As you know, David, uh, Roosevelt, when he became president, 33, had a different attitude. He wasn't that legalistic. He just wanted things done. So his vision along the same lines of the Hoover Dam was let's um, generate power using water, hydropower, uh, across the nation. They kind of arrange the economy by river basin. What's wrong with that? One, it's a political grab, but two, it turns out hydropower isn't that efficient, right? It's not our favorite form of power today. And so it's a classic example of the government betting wrong on an industry. And then in, in addition to that, they killed an industry that got it right, or let's say blamed it forever, put it in a forever wheelchair, which was utilities, um, which were busy lighting up the South themselves. And uh, part of the TVA-style extravaganza was to provide the electricity as well. That is, as you've written so often, the, the federal government crowding out local and private exercises. So it was, it was a terrible offense to civil rights. It was co- unconstitutional what the Black Committee did, but it was also... Um, Evil for a number of, I would say, evil for no, it's evil to kill the most promising industry in a depression, right? That's what they sought to do. Evil for a number of other reasons. Yeah, and one could make an argument if you're an environmentalist that there were some interesting experiments going on there, and things like, you know, solar power and that kind of the more decentralized power experiments. Now, you don't ever know where that stuff would have gone. Wind power, that there might have been, you know, opportunities for innovation beyond. Like you say, the one best system they were they were trying to impose. 
Well, yes, today, uh, TVA is popular with many, but it's number one enemy for many because of the environmental <laughs> consequences of, for example, the fertilizers that were in with the mix, right? What that did to the water of the South yeah, uh, we live with yeah. today. So the common thread here is the kind of a cavalier attitude toward constitutional jurisdiction and rules, uh, which seems similar across how the TVA was approached and how this uh, committee by committee surveillance was approached. And then, you know, to move on to another element of the story, uh, I'm noticing the part about uh, the Minton committee, Senator Sherman Minton, Democrat of Indiana. Uh, what was the Minton committee doing and how did that play into another kind of disregard for lawfulness? Well, black is elevated to the Supreme Court. And really, right. I would say a key reason was because of the black committee. He had been so effective. But apparently Roosevelt's first choice was Sherman Minton, according to some accounts, and he ends up on the court eventually. Um, Minton is a very is is a uh fairly dynamic younger senator uh from Indiana. He is brought in to the Democratic leadership, which is much older than him. So he, he, he really adds an element of vigor to it. And he plays a very big role in things like pushing for court packing. He is a, like Black, very much a New Deal loyalist, maybe even more so, if that's possible. And uh, Black is now gone. And so this committee is moribund, the lobbying committee, but it's still there. And they decide eventually the administration and other people are very upset by the opposition to court packing. They're very upset by the opposition to other plans that FDR is proposing, such as reorganization. So the motivations are very similar. And so they say, OK, let's turn it over to Minton, who is a freshman, by the way, at the time. Right. Doesn't have the seniority normally for this. And he's the chair of this committee. And they can't do telegrams anymore because an interesting legacy of the black committee is that there were some very powerful court rulings that, no, you can't do that. You can't take private telegrams in this wholesale way. That precedent holds throughout, you know, the 40s and the 50s with the other investigations. So it's very important. So he calls in witnesses like Black. He's very frustrated. He calls in a guy who was the president, former president of the University of Wisconsin. He really makes him look silly. And he eventually <laughs> gets very frustrated. So Mitten does this bill proposal where he proposes a bill to make it a felony to publish any article for any newspaper publishing any article known to be false fake news the whole fake news that sounds thing like was a ministry of disinformation period, but he has massive opposition which i think is encouraging from both the left and the right saying no nope, that's going too far his bill is sort of shouted down and laughed out <laughs> And he, he has it what reminds out. me reminds me of President Biden's initiative, what last year to create a ministry of disinformation of some kind to, to supposedly combat false information. Uh, sounds like a precursor. Oh yes, yeah, very and I, I think maybe Amity will agree with me on that 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 issue of false news, fake news, news the FDR said that news should be uh, developed uh, not out, out of the county houses. Right. Meaning he, he would go to these reporters and say, I like you guys. You're wonderful reporters, but I know you got to write what your bosses tell you. I know you right. have to do that. Well, there, there are two points that jump to mind. Uh, David's David's thought about Minton's youth. What happens when a new senator gets a leadership role? Right. It's, it's a real honor. It doesn't usually happen. New senators should be seen and not heard. Uh, mm -hmm. is the rule of the Senate. Yeah. Well, that senator will be really thrilled and double ambitious to make his mark because he doesn't want to squander this unusual opportunity. I think Ted Kennedy had the similar opportunity on the immigration law in 1960, five, four, like when that law was. And same thing. Uh, certainly the other senators knew what they were doing when they were allowing a young man to take the lead. They're going to get a lot of it, work out of that figure and a lot of a lot of splash and a lot of fireworks. Um, but the second point uh, to whether it's Minton or Black, 
um, relates to how we teach history now. And one of the things we learn in school is, well, the Republicans were awful mean in the 1950s. Joel McCarthy, right? They were bad people and they showed how bad they were. Have you no decency, sir? One of the lines that one of those forced to <laughs> call to testify before um, one of the McCarthy committees uttered. Um, but I've always thought, where where did Republicans learn how to behave in this bad way? Uh, or a sometimes too aggressive way. Where did they learn to trade on innu innuendo and rifle through people's papers? And I've wondered if, in a way, uh, it was just tit for tat. The Democrats did this so much whole scale, uh, um, abused people, abused people's rights, spread rumors, went on fishing expeditions in the 30s that Republicans learned from that and then sort of replicated the behavior on another issue, which would be, um, I don't know, working with the Soviet Union, the Cold War in the 50s. Where did that come from? And what do you, I wonder what you gents think about that, particularly David. And where do, where do people learn how to abuse others' rights for uh, some kind of smear campaign? Well, I will say, interestingly enough, the first time I heard the Black Committee, you know, I, you know, I, you know, teaching history for a while. I've never heard of this thing, right? First time I heard of it was an article, I think, from the early 50s from some conservative publication. They said, you know, we don't need another black committee. You know, the black, notorious that, black committee. So I said, it. what the heck is that? And you see actual statements from people very much along the lines you're saying. It's like, well, they, they're complaining now, but they were the ones doing all this. They were bringing sedition investigations. They were doing all this and all that. So, uh, Big deal, you know, uh, that well, it, it, they it, it, were very much aware of this. It was recent memory. Right. If you if you did a, a really good a search for Hugo Black and Joseph McCarthy or HUAC, the House Committee, um, you'd find a lot. But that's not how it's taught now. What it's is what is taught is Republicans are meaner than Democrats. And it's just not true, uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. in, in history. And of course, on top of that, um, it, you know, the, I, Arthur Herman has a very interesting book about McCarthy, which I commend to your audience. You know, which parts were blather and evil, and which parts were interesting. Um, so, so I, I think every time I go back to the '30s and the various campaigns against innocent people, I say, "Oh, oh, that's why the '50s happened." That that's uh, a big enlightenment uh -huh. for for me. Um, well, it's worth pointing I, out I, I that Roosevelt the worked part... in tandem with the black. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, worked no, of in course tandem did, with the me... black committee. It was an arm of the administration, basically. Or they, but... the arm is maybe wrong. They're they're working together, right? That is not true for Eisenhower and McCarthy. McCarthy's kind of a loose cannon, and he's his power, frankly, is exaggerated. He wasn't investigating Hollywood, as you know. That was the House Committee on Un-American Activities. But remember, he was a loose cannon to some extent. Eisenhower never liked him, never worked with him, and worked to undercut him. Slowly. Yeah. If you, if you, if McCarthy had his utility for the party, no question. Yeah. Um, and But what was that utility? And what part of it was valid and what part of it was creepy? That That's what we want to ask. But we, we can move on. We have so many other questions for you, David. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about radio, in part, not just because of your book, but because of a recent book called The Radio Right about the fairness doctrine, which is more, uh, comes into more recent history which used to kind of be a muzzle on on conservative talk radio, effectively, um, by Matsko is the author. What happened in the 30s with radio? And even before that, David, what happened in the 20s? Because I'm uh, I work for Calvin Coolidge at the Coolidge Foundation. And you suggest that Coolidge and Herbert Hoover, two 20s pre presidents, set, set Roosevelt up for, even enabled President Roosevelt to do uh, undertake some abusive, restrictive projects. Can you explain how that worked? What did Coolidge do wrong? What did Hoover do? And what did Roosevelt do? There was, the a, I think Hoover's driving this more than Coolidge. But, uh, you. you know, Coolidge goes along with it. So I'll say that. But, I mean, 
Hoover, from the beginning, the Secretary of Commerce, he's the guy in charge of radio regulation. To the extent there's radio regulation, and there really isn't much. And Hoover's view is these are uh, these shouldn't be owned by private businesses. These airwaves, this is uh, you know this is a, a, a these are public airwaves. They should be serving the public in a more generic way. He didn't like commercialism, uh, uh, but he doesn't want nationalization either. So Hoover's trying to construct a system, and that ultimately is a long story, and I go through the story in there, how that happens. Very I don't think it needed to happen the way it did, but it did. Anyway, uh, in, in Fed 1927, we get the creation of the Federal Radio Commission, which essentially takes over the airwaves and then uh, deletes a number of stations uh, for reasons of avoiding frequency interference, but a lot of it is because there's a there's a goal there to create kind of more generic uh, stations that will that aren't going to be specialized. They don't really like the idea of specialized stations, segmented markets. That's not something that is appreciated very much by regulators. And that comes in, but then Roosevelt really takes that system to town because initially all the networks are saying to Roosevelt, "You whatever you want." And he takes them seriously. And if he doesn't that want part, someone really on, he'll, me. he'll send a message to them. You know, if he doesn't like that, certain behavior, just a quick, and they will comply. Quick interruption. Quick interruption. That's the part that really stunned me, David, how the uh, head of the broadcasting companies put themselves at the service of, of Franklin Roosevelt at that point. I think some of that, and Amity may have more thoughts on this, maybe is a fear that, you know, they could get nationalization, Right. Maybe, uh, maybe, you know, this guy will do that. So let's cooperate. So Roosevelt has radio in his hip pocket throughout his tenure, but uh, newspapers are more in opposition to Roosevelt. So when he's complaining about the press, he's not complaining about radio. He's complaining about the print press, but unfortunately for his opponents, the print press is becoming gradually less influential. And by the end right, of his administration, right. radio is the main source of news for him. Americans. So the Hearst newspapers were particularly unimpressed with Roosevelt, as I recall. Supportive initially of him, but they turned against him. Oh, yes. that they turned against Hearst him. Did. Yeah. Yes. Amity, Amity, you pointed out uh, there was that funny poem on page 29, um, which had to, was published in the Hearst newspapers. Well, I'll uh, read you, that to you just for variety if it's still here. Yeah, cool. do. Here we, oh gosh, here we. Page 29. Page 29. Um, the you know these were just little rhymes people wrote about consensus to reflect consensus attitude towards the consensus perceived outrage of the intrusions of committees such as these. You may have thoughts, but you mustn't speak, or you'll be summoned by a New Deal sneak. <laughs> and here's another one: This is a country where speech is free and thoughts have absolute liberty. Subject, of course, to the third degree by Senator Black's I love committee. Yeah. Doesn't scan quite right, but anyway, <laughs> by Senator Black's committee. Uh, <laughs> and that uh, Ogden Nash has one too in our in our wonderful New Deal Rebels book, which uh, which David helped on, which is an anthology of critics at the time uh, from the period that is real time criticism, you know. Um, uh, uh, about a hen. I think humor sometimes did the best job of of piercing the bubble of falsehood of the administration. And some of these editorial cartoons. There's one I think we have in, in uh, your book, um, and we have it in this one as well. And that is a picture of the Hugo Black riding on a horse. Well, it's it says Hugo Black's committees dressed in night Night Rider guy garb, clan garb, you know, going and seizing private telegrams. Now, this is interesting because there were rumors that Black had been a member of the clan, but they were kind of in that territory. And the Chicago Tribune was one paper. They, they believed it and they said it. And it turned out, yes, he was. That became apparent after he was on the court. Had, he, had it become apparent before he was on the court, he might not have ended up on it. But it's fait accompli at that point. But it puts him in some 
defensive mode for a little while. Um, I think we we better move on to World War Two, or we'll never get there, right? Oh By yeah, your clock. go ahead, um, Graham. So yes, so I thought this was very useful, David. The way you get into the internment of the Japanese Americans, the executive order that made so much of this possible from the the desk at the White House, uh, Executive Order 9066, That's right. is that correct? And what laws and traditions, what did the government do? What were the cases against what the government did? Could you just explain that? Um, I don't think, I, I think many Americans don't even know about the internment of Japanese Americans. Well, basically what they did is it was a multi-step process and you get the executive order. And by the way, I used to assign Roosevelt's executive order but then people go, well, they would look at me like, what are you talking about? Because he talks about other persons. It's like, uh, you know, the Constitution's reference to slavery. He doesn't ter- use the term Japanese Americans in it. So it's useless to assign as a primary document unless you explain that. However, when you look at the actual enforcement of internment, it's by the military and they are very clear people of Japanese ancestry. And they use a two step process. The FBI didn't want any part of this. Basically, the Justice Department didn't. So it was the military. And they at first said, look, we have designated certain parts of the West, California, other parts of the West, East, the West Coast, military zones. And all people who shall be designated, right, they're very really vague about it initially, shall be, you know, um, Shall you know they put all sorts of restrictions on them. Then it finally basically said to them, "You have to evacuate." And then they also set up camps and said, "Well, you got to evacuate, and here's where you can go to these to these uh, collection centers, and then they will send you off into the desert, uh, <laughs> into uh, well, base of many of these places. These camps were in very inhospitable areas like deserts." Um, and so that's mm-hmm. what they do. It's a two-stage process of evacu- evacuation, removal, and then relocation uh, to camps. And during the whole evacuation period, they're doing all sorts people- of things like banning private radios and uh, guns. People have to leave, sell their property at fair buy or sell prices. They even have to sell their pets, destroy their pets. It's just pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> and David, we're talking about how many people? Uh, you're talking about, it's over a hundred thousand. I think it's like 120,000. Uh, but it's most of the Japanese American population One in the, the continental Coast. United States. They didn't do it in Hawaii. FDR wanted to in Hawaii, even after the executive order, he pushed for it. He wanted it. He wanted to take all the Japanese Americans in Hawaii, put them on one of the smaller islands. I forget which one. Wasn't Maui. Wow. But anyway, he wanted to well, put did. them on a smaller island. But then they finally said, the military finally stopped it and said, we can't afford this. We'll have to take troops off the front line to do this. Take ships off. I want I want, I want. to mention a book that I recommend to the viewers. Uh, it's called Just Americans, How Japanese Americans Won Award at Home and Abroad by Robert Asahina. And what Asahina reminds us of is not only the extent of the abuse of these internment camps and the whole process, but also the bravery of Japanese Americans for their service. And he works, uh, focuses specifically on some very rough battles in France where Japanese Uh. Americans fought so bravely and took a a high rate of casualties for these actions. So, and it's, it's a nice book because it's a happy, uh, fact-based book, not a crazy furious book, just Americans. Um, the, but then Roosevelt would do this and that the military would go along kind of surprises us um, looking back. It's part of the Roosevelt amnesia that we don't remember this. Mm-hmm. I, I was kind of um, hoping, David, that you would also address a case about the the Germans, uh, German spies, German saboteurs who landed on the East Coast, just a couple of them at Amagansett and in 
Ponte Vedra, Florida, where, where Ron DeSantis is from, and Magansett <laughs> is on Long Island. And these these German spies, just a few of them, maybe, uh, you know, fewer than a dozen, I believe, um, instantly gave the, turned themselves in. I think they were overwhelmed with America. They were supposed to sabotage the railroads or do something like that, but they gave themselves in, and then they were tried. Well, they weren't tried. They were basically executed before they had their full Supreme Court hearing because they were uh, not regular soldiers, but some kind of terrorists because it, war was on. They were executed even before the Supreme Court completely heard their case, which is known in the books as Kirin, Q-U-I-R-I-N. And that case provided the precedent for Guantanamo. Have you looked at that, I wondered? No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that, vaguely aware of that, but I did not focus on that. There's so many things you could look at. You know, I went lightly no, no, on the whole cri- IRS thing. I went lightly on a lot of things. No, I'm not criticizing it, but would you like to, is there some part of your book that we haven't addressed that you'd like to speak about in the minutes remaining? Oh, okay. I think you've, you've addressed it pretty well. Um, I, 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 the, the censorship of the press, I think is kind of an interesting for me, an interesting chapter because usually we get a a favorable comparison to FDR visa world war one well it wasn't as bad as wilson in terms of civil liberties but i think a lot of that doesn't uh, that argument doesn't take into account the fact that there was no opposition to the war world war ii very little opposition everybody uh, including a lot of these people prosecuted for sedition right after pearl harbor says well we're in it now we're fighting and so there wasn't an opposition press to speak of there were small little papers so they're actually getting very desperate to find people to prosecute. And I tell the story of one small town paper that's been forgotten called the Boise Valley Herald, which was anti-Japanese internment, pro-civil liberties, pro-civil rights paper. And they are actually have their mailing rights taken for a while. Um, wow. But that it's sort of illustrative because it's such an extreme example. Like, why are they doing this? Even people at the time say, why are you doing this to this small paper? It's because there's so much public support for the war, it's hard to find people to prosecute. Um, So I I don't buy that argument for a lot of reasons. Of course, that number of Japanese interned is far greater than the numbers imprisoned in World War I. But I think that that simply the conditions are different. Not that FDR is a more pro-civil liberties president, although a lot of his subordinates are pro-civil liberties. That's a part of the story that I found encouraging. FDR's own attorney general opposes internment. Jagger Hoover opposes Ah. it. Secretary of Interior Mm -hmm. opposes it. Not one of my favorite people normally, but Harold Ickes, you got to give him credit. He opposed it. So there was a lot of Mm -hmm. people in the administration who opposed it. Pushed back. The military commander in Hawaii, he he does not want to intern the Japanese Americans there. He uses bureaucratic delay, foot dragging, and other things and stops it. So we have that part of the story that I think is worth telling. Yeah, and there's, of course, the parts where uh, black-owned businesses and newspapers who happen to be Republicans and not pro-new dealers uh, were uh, leaned on by Democratic Party bosses with Roosevelt's uh, assent, apparently. There's just a lot of important details in this book. I'm really struck, actually, as a kind of summary um, by the phrase that you just used a moment ago, Amity. Maybe you coined it. Roosevelt amnesia. Is this a good antidote to Roosevelt amnesia, Amity? I think this is an excellent antidote to Roosevelt amnesia. I mean, David's work generally is, I, I, I can't leave any radio show without mentioning from mutual aid to the welfare state, um, which corrects another area of Roosevelt amnesia. What David shows through this stunning book, it, it, we have the assumption to because of the amnesia, that there was no social welfare network at all before the New Deal brought social security. And what David shows in this book is the network of little and larger uh, community groups, mutual aid, uh, societies, clubs, religious groups, that to a much larger extent than we ever imagined took care, to use that word, that verb 
of Americans. It's it, And what David also shows is that the New Deal crowded out these little groups. I think uh, Tocqueville-wise, Tocqueville is America, where the community got together, made the burial society. And to this day, uh, I teach this book when I can, from mutual well, aid to you. the welfare state. So David is the um, maestro of um, curtailing Roosevelt amnesia. Thank oh, you. Right. And I do wish some other people would see me start writing about these things, the mutual aid thing. For example, my book's getting kind of old, and I was hoping that there'd be a lot of more research, but it just... Well, maybe we should reprint it someday. Hey, who knows? Well, hey, that's uh, up yeah, to, we that's talk up about to Graham. That. <laughs> we could talk about that. Listen, um, we are so grateful for your work in combating Roosevelt amnesia, also uh, Amity Schles's work. I encourage our friends to take a good look at this book that we have just barely scratched the surface of, The New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights, The Untold Story of FDR's Concentration Camps, Censorship, and Mass Surveillance. It's available on Amazon, also on our website, independent.org. So thank you so much, David Beto, noted historian. Thank you. And thank you to Amity Schles as well. Historical mind par excellence. Thank you for joining here, us, here. Amity. Thank you, friends. Okay, have a great day. Come back again sometime and join us on Independent Conversations. Take care, everybody.